Video essayists have a real problem with brevity, so I'll just keep my justification short here. For the same reason Devil May Cry 3 fans knew they loved the game as soon as they saw this. The same reason Killer 7 fans are glued to the screen from this. I knew I was going down with the Uno ship as soon as I witnessed something as admittedly trivial as the company logo. And that's not to minimize the endless frustration that comes from its gameplay, which prompted a remake in the first place, or make it out like its aesthetic as its primary value, because even though Uno comes across as a by-the-numbers product of its era, its identity is both obsessed with the future and trapped in the past. While a lot of people who are big into games can probably give you a good estimate of what console any given game came out on purely on sight, <laughs> there is no hiding the origin of a PC-98 game. As a 16-bit computer that was great for detailed drawing, and unlike Western computers had a comprehensive list of Japanese characters to use, but was shabby for animation, two main genres would dominate the system over its lifespan. Initially it was strategy games like the Romance of the Three Kingdoms series, which established the computer as Japan's foremost gaming PC, but in the modern age, the PC-98 is pretty much synonymous with visual novels. The PC-88 series that preceded it had previously released the overwhelmingly popular Portopia Serial Murders, a mostly text-based murder mystery that for the first time let you hunt down leads in a non-linear fashion, which, while not exactly leading to a wildly branching narrative, did mark one of the first meaningful differences between a traditional story and a story told by a video game. All eyes were on the developers of this new generation, of which there were many. The power to create had been set free to the masses through the very devices they'd used to play their games. While the old guard would stay relatively stagnant with their creativity over this period, settling into franchises about mysteries of murder and violence, a new breed of visual novel was growing in popularity, as people with less resources started to sink their teeth into the other vice that pushes your product. Pornography. And as much as the Puritans may contest, it's easy to see which side was winning in the East. Sex not only sold, but discovered a structural breakthrough early on via the idea of routes, as now your stories could start at point A and end anywhere from points B to F depending on whose pants you slipped into. It was a money-making enterprise to make erotica for the PC-98, but as for its broader appeal, they were far and away mediocre titles that would fade into obscurity over the next decade, indistinguishable from each other and barely changing this core formula once it was developed. Eventually, as could have been reasonably predicted from even a cursory glance at Japanese art history, the sexy side started to consume all other formulas and genres around it. Sex horror, sex comedy, sex puzzle, and soon enough the strategy games that once defined the market were cornered by sex too. For the Japanese over 18 audience, a clear trajectory had formed for the future of PC gaming, as every instance of gameplay became as auxiliary as the minute-long story of the plumber helping the woman fix her pipes. My name is Carl, you should be an expert. One of the most obvious fusions on paper for these visual novels was to combine the erotica with mystery, a genre still doing well on its own terms even in some places overseas. And at the forefront of this combination was a company called Seas Ware, more specifically a man by the name of Hiroyuki Kano. Starting out as a peripheral staff member, he inadvertently found himself as the perfect writer for the job as both a fan of classic mystery fiction like Sherlock Holmes and a pervert, who would slowly but surely move the company's focus from the latter to the former. He would write the company's three next games and direct two of them. His first two, Etsuraku no Gakuen, localized in English as Love Potion, and Desire, were both centered around getting to the bottom of a mysterious conspiracy surrounding an organization that, unsurprisingly, was about rape. And while the third, Xenon, spun a sci-fi tale which stood out among its ranks, its pornographic quota still wormed its way in through any hole the plot would allow. While Seasware was raking in praise and cash for putting themselves above their lazy competitors, who were happy to churn out shameless erotica at a high rate, the classical mystery fanatic within Kano was hungry for more. And so, after building up a great reputation both within the company and from the consumers, he would write the scenario for his most ambitious work thus far, and the first Seasware would publish with no sex scenes. Eve Burst Era. What should have been a poorly thought out business decision, attempting to appeal to a non-pornographic audience despite its company's reputation and the admittedly still very sexual designs, paid back dividends critically and commercially almost immediately. Previous stories of small town molestation and secret island sex rings had now expanded to government conspiracies told from multiple perspectives, and the innovative gameplay concepts that the pink market used to sell itself on came back through this gimmick. Now, new consumers who were put off by the sexual content were intrigued by the notion of playing two seemingly disconnected characters whose actions impacted each other and tied the broad mystery together just as 
pulp crime fiction did. And it all came from talented artists and developers who apparently had just been hiding in plain sight. While Erige fans across Japan were starting to reevaluate how important the plot of their porn was to them, Kano had finally gotten the attention of people who used to look down on his industry, and more importantly, the attention of the big dogs of that very industry. He and his recurring composer, Umemoto Ryu, were picked up by Elf, former innovators in the field, with the RPG series Dragon Knight and the codifier of the route system itself, Dokusei, who had now settled into routine and unremarkable sequels and successes. Keen to reinvent themselves and eager to ride the wave they could see forming on the horizon, it was a smooth process made even smoother by Kano's love of their earlier works. Now not only was he working with the people who had inspired him to start, but they were truly at his beck and call. The budget was bigger, development time was longer, and there was no upper limit given to what he was about to create. There were no illusions that this was the sink or swim moment for his career, possibly the one chance Kano's ambition would have in the spotlight cast by a Goliath publisher. And while Elf's plan may have simply been to wield this ambition to reclaim their industry dominance of a few years prior, or at least justify the extra time and money they put into this, his model of scenario wouldn't be satisfied unless it revolutionized the visual novel genre. From the word go, it's hard to gauge exactly what kind of story Yuno is. After jumping from a cryptic opening set in a western-style study to the exotic display of the title screen, we settle into what appears to be an everyday seasware-style product. Modern, school-centric setting filled with female candidates, a list of verbs to choose between, all told through the eyes of the lecher with a heart of gold protagonist mandated by the tropes of the time. But the more we see, the less true these three points become. As a start, once the game begins, the verb-noun interaction mechanics are dropped in favour of a point-and-click style, a more western innovation, and certainly new for Kano. It becomes apparent that our main character Takia is ingenuine in his repeated innuendos, as we see him grapple with the loss of his father and the fallout from it, in everything from his recent delinquency at school to his awkward exchanges with his overwhelmed stepmother. And to assume Yuno would play like a straight successor to Dokusei would be a grave mistake. The many routes range from tales of corporate espionage, to horror stories reminiscent of Kano's older works, to exploring an ancient cave, to a more refined version of the romantic drama one might expect from the product, including with one last grand twist to all the player who thinks they've seen it all. The genre-defying collection of stories behind each of the romantic candidates is tied together by Yuno's biggest innovation, time travel. The sci-fi framing of the plot centers on the broad goal given to Takio by his father, to collect eight jewels and meet him at the mysterious local landmark of Triangle Mountain. Explained through some dense windows of delightful pseudosciences how to use the jewels you've collected to set jewel saves, and how to load one with any items you've collected in the future through the very first instance in a video game of a route flowchart. While the design of older dating sims formed around an ethos of pick who you want and stop when you want, chances are your girl of choice needs an item from the future in someone else's route. With an ultimately linear plot, the focus is on that which surrounds the heroines instead of the heroines themselves. To call the sprawling and innovative scenario of Yuno a labor of love is an extreme understatement. Kano's career had already been on a clear upward trend, following up the thinly veiled porno plot of his debut with a well-respected mystery sci-fi trio which pushed the envelope a little more each release. But the Yuno plan had been brewing since his teenage years and it shows. From the no longer disposable characters, to the quick-witted script, to the overwhelming ambition clear in its design. Removing it from the Seasware canon only demonstrates more dramatically the difference between the mass-produced market smut and Kano's precious little brain baby. Where your average harem builder could offer you an art book at best, you know would give you the supposed source for all the pseudoscience quotes throughout the game in the form of a 26-page fictional thesis on the scientific formulas needed to time travel, equations and all. And all of this sounds good, great even, but it doesn't take a particularly keen eye to see that most of these compliments are given relative to the other products of its time. As with many classics from bygone eras, its shortcomings are clear in its outdated gameplay mechanics. For starters, it has some of the same annoyances of other classic point-and-click adventure games in how easy it is to get stuck. The difference between life and death in one instance is down to which room you choose to answer a phone call in. The trial and error nature of this is made even more tedious via the limited number of saves available to you, through what is narratively a very cool system, but gameplay-wise a nightmare for people unlucky enough to get walled off multiple times in a row. On top of that, progressing the plot in any route, whether you've done it already or not, is a teeth-pulling experience. Nothing progresses until you've witnessed the next event that you need to see, regardless of if the game points you in the direction, or even if what happens is significant to the plot at all, making the end result look something like this. Rinse and repeat.
The market's answer to this quandary was, unsurprisingly, remake everything from the ground up with a fresh $60 price tag on the hood. Or one of many AniTubers' Crunchyroll promo codes for the accompanying anime adaptation. Recreating the music with modern tech and redrawing the art with a... modern presentation. Released in 2017 in Japan and 2019 for everywhere else, Spike Chunsoft promised a streamlined version suited for the modern age. Gone are the pesky sex scenes, gone is the lengthy process of backtracking, and if you weren't sold on that already, we even color-coded the flowchart. But even with all the mechanical fixes, and ignoring the aesthetic-based complaints that many have levied, the question still stands of if the plot of Yuno can satisfy the taste of the modern age. What used to be a mind-blowing final arc is now an overdone cliché after recent anime trends, and is concluded with a taboo which strains what a more standard audience could accept. No! Nothing exemplifies this shift in expectations for the genre quite like the main character Takuya. For the time when he came out, his external presentation as a playboy who concealed his deeper, conflicted emotions was a great reflection of the game itself, being an overtly sexual product with grand aspirations lurking within. But now, in a sanitized remake lacking all sexual content, he reflects his work in a different way, a confused pervert lost in the kosher VN market now that his lewdness isn't the norm of the medium. The anime adaptation suffered even greater complaints from Takuya's over-the-top skirt chasing, in a medium where we aren't often privy to the inner monologue of characters and, for better or for worse, to an audience unable to tolerate the more extreme of his antics. Squaring up against those inspired by it highlights the plot's incompatibility further. While new consumers have certainly seen many examples of the plot device of time travel, Yuno's take on it is hyper-focused and starry-eyed. Everything about the plot is a further exploration of the science of it, the consequences of it, but most importantly, how it can be wielded as a force of good. But contrasting it with a more recent story like Steinsgate, which has seen no shortage of comparisons, time travel now seems to be framed as a duplicitous Faustian contract. While Yuno's gameplay centers on using time travel as a means to various ends, watching our protagonist blossom in a coming-of-age story by fixing the unfixable and improving the future, the latter half of Steinsgate has its protagonist accept that these powers are too dangerous, and work to undo all the changes caused by them in service of a simpler existence. A message quite fitting for the 21st century movement of market-friendly virtual entertainment. In this new canon, the remake is far too alien to blend in with its peers, and even as an unorthodox product, the point of the story has now lost its meaning entirely. The branching plot and its wildly different routes, all representative of completely different genres, used to be more than just a radical collection for a single narrative, but a vision for what the future of visual novels could look like when not simply beholden to sex and predictable structure. Here we are, just shy of 25 years in the future, and that wish has come true. Respected names in the industry tell experimental tales with any wild concept they can think of, and low-budget mystery fans like Kano himself used to be are now capable of making their dreams work, as long as they have a keyboard and a lot of patience. Hell, nothing indicates your formula's success like KFC churning out a propaganda piece of their own through it. Visual novels as a genre owes the world to you, know, but the more accessible successes to it are the only ones who can now reap the rewards. All of this being said, I didn't need to write an essay to feel how I feel about remaking Yuno. Why did I find myself instinctively shifting in discomfort when I first laid eyes and ears on the refurbished product? It could be the art style, previously indistinguishable from its peers even a decade before its release, but now with a period piece style charm and rarity by today's standards that lets its attentive pixel art shine. It could be the soundtrack, one that I wouldn't hesitate to call one of the greatest of all time in its quality, quantity, and sheer diversity. It could be the admirable display of making these two elements within the harsh system limitations of its time, where multiple sprites for a single character was a serious expense and any theme was bound by a limited number of tracks which could play at a single time. The idea of shot-for-shot -shot remakes in general has also been critiqued by plenty before me, straddling the line between faithful and lazy. But the real reason, I think, is that in all of its charming, janky, outstanding, frustrating ties to its point of origin, Yuno is, ironically enough, unable to travel through time. But like a time capsule buried in shallow dirt by people who were kids 30 years ago, all we need to do is dig it back up to be whisked back to that time of great potential.
Thank you.